our biblical theology series. We are now moving to a different theme. It's the kingdom of God. It's going to be a three-part series like I expect all of the themes that we do to go. So this morning is part one of the kingdom and the handouts are out there. Uh, Samuel Renahan quotes, uh, I thought a good quote, so I added it to the top. The kingdom that Adam should have built but failed to build, and the kingdom that Israel was designed to prefigure and prepare, that kingdom was the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ. So you notice there from that quote, there's a, uh, a combination of kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, and kingdom of Christ. So as I'm going to teach on the kingdom of God, I'm going to... Um, consider that phrase to be equivalent to kingdom of Christ and consider that to be equivalent to the kingdom of heaven. So, I think now, and you'll see on the handout too, there's four points. There's an introduction, there's the kingdom of creation, kingdom of Israel, and kingdom of God. This is not an easy doctrine to uh, study. It's very broad. It's complex. It involves a lot of uh, um, interrelated themes in the Bible, um, from a people, a land, uh, to a king, uh, to God and his institution of that king, a covenant, so forth. And... Then we see there's kingdoms, different, different kinds of kingdoms at times, uh, like with Israel versus the kingdom of Christ. So there's a lot that you will have to uh, read and, and consider, and it, it's not an easy doctrine. So having said that, please try to pay attention. Uh, don't treat this like justification by faith even though that has its complexities to some. But uh, I use that doctrine because for me it's clear. I think for most of you it's clear and it's pretty easy, or easy to follow. This one, though, you're going to have to relate things um, and listen carefully. So first of all, uh, under the introduction, God's supreme dominion. If you'll turn to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So this is a very broad sweeping statement. It's focused on the earth and the world, but, you know, by... Uh, Implication: We can apply it to all the cosmos and the angels if we wanted to um, meditate on this. But it's focused on the earth and all those who dwell in it. And that's our domain, the earth. We're not going, I mean, people travel to the moon and things like that, but they're not going to live other places. So it, essentially, all that you know is the Lord's. Uh, and that's relevant because when we're talking about particular kingdoms, like the kingdom of Christ, you might wonder, well, what about Satan's rule? What about the kingdoms of men on the earth throughout history? Um, is not God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, over all and you would be right to ask that and say that. So when I'm using this phrase, kingdom of God, I'm referencing what Jesus would reference when he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And when he talks about there are only those who enter the kingdom like children who enter the kingdom. So what about this sovereignty of God and his rule 
over all things. Do we not call that the kingdom of God? You could. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that's not the way I'm going to use that phrase for this class, but I want you to know I recognize that truth. That God is sovereign over all. He owns all. Satan is his. Um, he will do right. He will judge all. Um, if you turn to Psalm 33, 13 through 15, the Lord... The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. So, another statement similar to Psalm 22, but this is just saying that he sees them all. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what local kingdom or age they live in. Um... He fashions their hearts. So he rules. He is sovereign. Daniel 4.35, which is a very familiar text for many. This is when Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses. And... He says in verse uh, 30, I'll start in 34. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored God who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? That one's very, very clear. It's coming from Nebuchadnezzar, a man um, of whom God exercised his sovereign authority over in the midst of his depravity. So even though Nebuchadnezzar is not under the reign of Christ as a believer, he's under the reign of God in that sense. You know what I'm... Um, so when we're in... Um, when we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God, what we're going to be referencing is this kingdom that Christ has... Uh, uh, become the resurrected king who is seated at the right hand of God and um, as mediator, God-man, he reigns over all creation. Um, But his kingdom does not have subjects that receive all of his blessings. There will be those that are thrust out and an everlasting punishment. And uh, now, going to the next thing, before we read a simple definition, in time, in history, there are particular kingdoms. Um, You know, like I said, Jesus said, my kingdom is not when he was being tried. And there's three major kingdoms that we're going to address, and they all are leading to this final kingdom of which is Christ resurrected and returned glorified and his people resurrected, judged, and him reigning as their king. So the first two kingdoms are the kingdom of creation, is what, what I'm calling it. Um, I'm not making that up. It's just uh, coming from Renahan. I found it very helpful because it focuses in on what God's will was with Adam and the covenant of works. Um, And then we're going to look at Israel. God made them a kingdom of priests. 
And they were uh, different than all those that were of, the, of, Ad, of uh, Adam. There were some who were not in that kingdom, Gentiles. And, and then we'll look at the fulfillment of all of this revelation and Jesus Christ being the king of the kingdom of God. So, um, the kingdom of creation points to the kingdom of God, the final eschatological kingdom of God, in that it already lays the groundwork uh, in multiple ways. It gives us, through the historical events of the garden and its layout, through the tree and of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, uh, through God's purpose in creating man, uh, through Adam's relation to the rest of uh, humanity and God's covenant with Adam. There, there's many facets of what God is doing with Adam that lays the foundation not only for the necessity for a savior, but lays the foundation for the revelation of, this, of the kingdom of God. Because uh, I want to show you connections about how, um, and, and some of you are already aware of these, but there is the, the trees and the garden there. And then you'll see uh, like the candelabra or the lampstand. It looks like a tree in the tabernacle, which... Over in the garden, we see God going to and fro. He's walking in the cool of the garden. And then we see him in the tabernacle. It's his place of dwelling. Those are those two kingdoms. And then you go all the way to Revelation 22, and you see the tree of life again in the eschatological kingdom. So <clears throat> this tree of life has significance, and it informs us of things because it's all the way back there in creation. So God is already um, revealing to come in the covenant, the kingdom of creation. So let's do that. Let's look at the simple definition. It's a king ruling over a people in a place according to a covenant. So uh, some people emphasize God's sovereignty as the kingdom, uh, but it's appropriate that we remember and that a king rules over a people and in a locale or realm. And according to a covenant. I'm talking about kingdoms that God establishes. Um, and also, when we're talking about this simple definition, it's the simple definition is, is here to help inform you of these particular kingdoms, the, the kingdom of creation, the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of God. These particular kingdoms uh, have different covenants that determine its membership, and many of its laws, interactions, um, the way things are to be carried about. If you think about the covenant God made with Israel when he, when he redeemed them from Egypt and he made them a kingdom of priests, he gave them the ceremonial system. So the covenant that he made with them brought with it a lot of laws, positive laws that determine the way to live in that kingdom. Uh, so, this definition adds to there according to a covenant. And let's look at Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man, 
uh, 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne, King, of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But he does not say inherit the kingdom to those on his other side. He says in verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So right here in our definition, you can see Christ, the Son of Man, is a king. He's ruling over all because he's judging all. And he has a particular relation to those who receive the kingdom or inherit it. So his rule over them comes with blessing. But his rule over those who are not his leads to their being cursed or destroyed. We also see that there are a people who are of his kingdom and inherit it. Um, it doesn't speak here much about a place, uh, but we know that from other texts that when Christ does return, you know, he's coming to earth. And we know that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. There will, everything will be melted with a fervent heat. Um, and we also know that Christ reigns as the Son of Man when He comes in His glory according to the new covenant shed in His blood. So he's the king according to the covenant of redemption, which is, mediates the new covenant between his people and the Father. So it's according to a covenant. Before we get more into it, I wanted to just mention, you know, I didn't add into this definition uh, the presence of God. Um, so I want to talk about that briefly, though. Um, now if you think about Adam and we're going to look at him at point two but just bear with me for a second if you think about Adam God intended him to rule to administer and subdue um, administer his will subdue the earth fill and subdue he was the federal head of that covenant. Um, and it would have been a kingdom. Um, now, is Adam uh, supreme? You could say he's supreme over creation, but is he supreme over God? No. His kingship is one of vice regency acting on behalf of God so what he does is for God what he does is determined by God ultimately it's God's reign and this person Adam is his vice regent and I'll read to you what a vice regent is A deputy of a regent and a regent um, is like a king so uh, someone that's being a deputy of a king like Adam you could say they have that that rule that they're supposed to administer and a commission that they're supposed to fulfill on behalf of the commission given to them by God but that commission 
And that uh, commandment to rule is on behalf of God and for God's glory. And as it is administered, it is the manifestation of the reign of God over that creation. So when we're talking about a king ruling over a people, we should never think of it as apart from God, as if God um, gets it started and he's isolated from it. It's always up underneath him and for him. Not that he needs it, but it's to manifest his glory. So now, God's presence and glory. So, there was God in the cool of the uh, garden, the cool of the evening. Uh, so you know in Genesis that uh, there, that place, the garden, was a dwelling place where God dwelt with Adam and Eve. And that theme, which you see there, God dwelling with his man made in his image, is repeated again in the kingdom of Israel where God has the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant with the two cherubim. And on top of the mercy seat, there dwells God. Not in, it's the Shekinah glory. It's a local manifestation through a cloud of God's glory representing him dwelling with his people. Uh, and that kingdom of Israel was built around the ceremonial system. The, the, the camp was laid out around the tabernacle. It was at the very center of everything. So the whole thing centers around the presence of God and his people dwelling with him in this kingdom. And then in the kingdom of God, which Christ is... God's vice regent or God's king, um, he is God, but he's not the father, and he is uh, man as well as God. And he takes this place in the economy of redemption according to the covenant of redemption of being that mediator, the king over God's people, administering God's covenant for all eternity over those who are in the kingdom on behalf of the glory of God. Um, And in that covenant, God's dwelling is with man eternally and there's no veil like there was in the old covenant Uh, because his people are he being the mediator and fulfilling all their need according to a covenant of grace not a covenant of works they have all that they need in him and are transformed into his image and can dwell with God and God dwell with them But there again is the presence of God. And, and also, all these things are for his glory. Okay. So I already talked about that. I think about too, like uh, the kingdom of Israel. You know, a, a king, when we're talking about a kingdom, uh, a, and I wrote the simple definition, a king ruling over a people in a place according to a covenant. So when you think about Israel, Think with me about what they, what they were like as a people before the judges and then after the judges. They did not actually get a physical king until Saul. Um, but they were already a kingdom. Look at Exodus 19.
This is a very commonly referenced verse in your Bible. Like today, everybody seems to know John 3.16. Because they know the New Testament a lot better than they know the Old Testament. But if, if you're a, a Jew, he would know this verse real well, like a John 3.16. So it would do, do you well to memorize 4 through 6. Exodus 9, 19, 4 through 6. He says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And of course we know that they enter into covenant with God, um, and they sin, Moses intercedes, um, there's a re- um, you know, the new tablets are made, but ultimately they do commit. There's a covenant made. God imposes it and they restipulate, they respond, and then the covenant is formally ratified. And they are already the children of Abraham. So this is just a covenant in succession with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant to further uh, uh, give the laws and the ways in which they're going to be blessed within these covenants of promise as the kingdom of Israel. But what I want you to see here is that he says, you shall be to me a kingdom. But they don't actually receive a king, a physical king, until a good while later. You think about all the judges. So are they not a kingdom? Because, Ryan, your definition says a king ruling over a people. They don't have a king. Can you call them a kingdom? Yes. Who's their king? God. God doesn't need the, the agent to administer sovereignty over some local realm. He can, he's omnipotent eternal, omnipresent, owns all things, and is God, and at the same time, administer himself without the necessity of a body, exercise reign over a local kingdom. He can do both. So Israel didn't actually need a physical king. And it's a kingdom. Of course, it takes, uh, God did, we know, intend to make a promise to David, and that promise would uh, ultimately lead us to Christ. It would hone us down into the very line in which the seed would come, and we know that the old covenant was patterned after the new. It was a shadow of the substance. It was a copy of the true uh, they were servants of the sons, so to speak. And uh, it should make sense to us as well that God would want a king, a physical king, because he, we know that he intends and does through his decree and his covenant. He's going to have his son become a man and be the mediator, the king over the kingdom of God in the new heavens and the new earth. And he, in his sovereignty, brings those things about through Israel's sin. They want Saul. But if you look at, uh, uh, I think y'all know from Judges 21 that everyone did what was right in his own eyes because there was no king in Israel. But if you go to 1 Samuel 9, Uh, verse 17. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you, the one, this one shall reign over my people. 
I just wanted you to see there that although the, peop- the children of Israel sinned against the Lord and wanted a king, they, I thought it was very interesting. They wanted a king, it's, and I don't have the text ready, I'm sorry. Somebody can look this up on their phone and maybe go find it, but you have to take my word for it or go look up, make a note, go look up on your own time. But they wanted a king like the other nations. And essentially what they were saying is they want a new religion, they want a new king, and they want new laws. I want it like what they got. I don't like the way we got it with God. That was the sin. So then God let them have the desires of their heart with Saul. They see the folly of when man chooses a king. And then God says, you chose a king. I'm going to choose a king after my heart. And he chose David. But um, that gives you some framework to, to think about how a kingdom develops, but it still has God as its king before a physical king came into place. Ruling, exercise, authority according to law. Uh, the laws are differ for kingdoms. Um, children of Israel have different laws than the, the kingdom of God. People, uh, a realm, a place, a covenant. I've already referenced the covenant, but if you go to the next point, kingdom and covenant. Um, covenants function as the legal basis upon which God interacts with man in a given kingdom. So covenants function as a legal basis upon which God interacts with man in a given kingdom. So when we're talking about not the the sovereign rule over God over all things that never changes, that he always, like Psalm 24, 33, and Daniel 4, not talking about that, but when we're talking about these particular kingdoms of God in history, when he interacts with man in those particular kingdoms, he does it according to covenants. These covenants that kind of serve as the legal basis upon which he's going to interact with them. King, kingdoms manifest themselves in visible forms through the terms of the covenant. So when Adam was not supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's because he was in a covenant with God. If that covenant was not in place, he could eat of that tree. That covenant says you shall not eat, so it determined the behavior of the subject in that kingdom, which, of course, Adam himself, um, being the federal head, is like a king, but... But even Eve, she's not to eat of it as well. You know, so you can see there the, the terms of the covenant are determining the, the, uh, the way in which you're going to be ruled. Also, the terms of that covenant determine Adam to be king. Not you. Not Eve. Adam. God chose Adam. So what determined that? God did. And he made a covenant with Adam. We know from um, Romans chapter 5, like 14 through 19, and all the way down to 22 or 1, that Adam was a representative just like Christ is in the new covenant. Adam was, what he did when he sinned was on behalf of all people. And the effects of Adam's sin with the imputation of his sin to all people today we're cursed because of the covenant God made with Adam. So there's a relationship between covenants and kingdoms. Uh, in short, kingdoms are covenants realized. And there's a Exodus 19 again. I'm not going to turn there. Let's go to the kingdom of creation. So if you would turn to Genesis... Chapter 1. 
Let's see. So where do we see a kingdom uh, established by God in creation? Where do we see this kingdom of creation? Why do we call it a kingdom? Well, building upon this relationship that we know between covenants and kingdoms, a follow-up question is, what covenant is realizing the kingdom of creation? What covenant is um, manifesting the kingdom of creation? And we call it the covenant of works. We call it the covenant of works instead of the covenant of grace because Adam was required to perfect obedience in order to receive the promised blessing signified by the tree of life. That's if you're wondering why it's a covenant of works, it's different than the new covenant. The new covenant is the covenant of grace. We don't have to do to live. Someone else had to do that. Jesus Christ, he did and lived And when we're in union with him, we live. And then we do. We live first, then we do. And the doing is not meritorious, it's out of thanksgiving. So, um, how do we know there's a covenant here? You know, if, if you're saying to me that there's a kingdom here, or intended here, And then you're saying, okay, well then the covenant of works is determining that kingdom. Where's the covenant? Uh, Well, let's try to build that. So first of all, the kingdom of creation, according to the covenant of works, first of all, let's consider man's natural condition. Man is created good. There's more text given to the sixth day than any of the other days. Man is created in God's image. And that's repeated twice. Man is given dominion. That's kingship. Reign. And man is commissioned to subdue and fill the earth. If you look at Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the bird, and over the cattle over all the earth over and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. I heard a pastor say, have you ever seen an oak tree when it, get, when it drops its acorns? There's so many acorns, you could have a full-time job just trying to get them all up all the time if it's a big grown oak tree. If you imagine God creating the earth without thorns, without a curse, uh, even though it is perfect and good and blessed, it requires order there is the abundance there is a harvest to be had there is uh, work to be done Um, there is a keeping of the garden a guarding of the garden Um, and that work was for an upright man innocent pure and holy made in the image of God did not come with sweat like the curse brought. I'm not saying they didn't sweat, but it it didn't come with like this pained labor that we have where we even like find the sun oppressive. But that was a blessed, blessed function that he had was 
to bring order. And he's saying, fill the earth, subdue it. Bring order for my glory into all the earth. God's rule is to be administered by man over the earth. What does that mean to be, um, fill it, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply? What does that mean? Somebody said, have babies. That's right. So if they had had a baby and they had not fallen, would that baby have been sinless? Yes. So you can imagine if this is fulfilled, you would have an earth filled with holy people. And you can see God's intention there. His glory filling the earth. Now let's look at man's covenantal condition, the kingdom of creation. So there, there you see um, dominion, so a ruling. You see a people intended. And now if you look at man's covenantal condition. Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden to work and keep it. Genesis 2.9. The tree of life, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll read that in 15. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, good for food. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So he made, Eden is this place and within Eden is a garden. The garden has the trees in the midst of it. And what you see is Adam is placed in the garden. I'm going to share something with that with you. Eden was not man's initial and natural location. Adam was formed, then Eden, Eden was prepared, then Adam was placed in Eden. The description of, of Eden tells us the purpose for which Adam was placed there. The garden contained the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam was placed in this garden to work it and keep it. And so what you see there is God's, Adam's placed in the garden. So God's doing something uh, specific related to this place, Eden. And then you see him uh, telling him to work and and if you were to look, if you look briefly at Numbers, hold your place, go to Numbers 3. Starting in verse 6. Bring, bring the tribe of Levi near, that's the Levitical priesthood, Levi's, they're the priests. Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may serve. That serve there is the same word as uh, keep. Where was it? Back here, 15. I'm sorry, tend. And the word keep, if you keep going, and they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle to do the work of the tabernacle and they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle to do the, new, to do the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle and you shall give the Levite to the Aaron and Aaron his sons and they are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel so you shall appoint his sons and they shall attend to their priesthood but the out, outsider who comes near shall be put to death the, the two words, you could do this with like blue letter Bible, but if you want to look at the two Hebrew words, Hebrew words for um, tend and keep here in verse 15 in Genesis 2, you could find those repeated here in verses 6 and 7 for uh, serve and work. But they also have this guarding effect. But you'll find those exact words. So what we know from this co uh, correlation is where do the children of Israel, Levi, priest, 
operate. They're inside the service of the tabernacle. Adam was placed inside Eden to tend and keep it. And you see this relationship of more than just subdue and take dominion, you see elements of a covenantal relationship where God is giving them specific positive law. And it becomes even more clear when he says, this tree you shall not eat. And then when he does eat, he's forbidden to access the tree of life, which signified blessing of an eternal blessing had he kept his uh, commission, had he kept the covenant. So the fact that he was thrust out of the garden, there was a sword turning all these ways, the flaming sword, and the angels were put in place, that is uh, showing us that he was thrust out and particularly from 324, I think, not allowed to access this tree. So he has now, in sinning, broken that covenant and is underneath the curse of it and no longer has access to the blessing of it. So that uh, helps us see that this was a kingdom that God in, had established at creation and it, he had intent through Adam for that, you know, in the way that it was given to Adam, the way that the tree of life was given Adam being responsible for his sin, we know that had he fulfilled it, it would have led to the filling of the earth with the holy seed and the glory of God spreading as Eden was propagated through their, uh, through their keeping of that covenant and then receiving its blessing. So you, what I'm saying there is in creation, we have a covenant and a kingdom. And from there, we're going to, build and go to the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God. But don't lose sight of these elements. And we didn't have time, but you could look at these texts. You can also go back to Genesis 1 and think about what things there in 1 and 2 are picked up and repeated in the Bible, uh, like rivers, trees, um, like I said earlier, the tree of life. Also, uh, speaking of a mountain, consider mountains in the Bible. God dwelling in mountains, on mountains, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. Well, the garden or Eden is on a mountain. And there's rivers flowing, and then you have rivers flowing in uh, Revelation. So God is already preparing us and uh, all who read <laughs> what he's going to do with his king, the kingdom of God in Christ. Um, last, uh, before I, I know that we're out of time, but last point is on here I have according to the Noahic covenant. So it was a, a, a tragedy that's we can't describe fully when man fell. Um, when man sinned and death entered the world, um, that cursed state, according to the covenant of works that we're all now in, unless you're in Christ, but I'm talking about the world, when the Noahic covenant came after the flood, even though Noah was a righteous man, he was a righteous man because he believed in Christ and lived by faith. But he was not like a the new creation. God did recreate, but that was not uh, any end time event. And all God did when he instituted the covenant with Noah is he stabilized uh, all those who were already cursed in the covenant of works by saying he will never punish them and wipe them off the face of the earth with water again. And he also said seed time and harvest, cold, and all these seasons will remain in place. What he was doing was he was stabilizing and providing a stable platform and context that would 
maintain common grace throughout history until the coming of his son. So that covenant um, comes to the cursed people. They're still cursed, but they have common grace now in the, new co- in the Noahic covenant. And they have a promise, all, all people, all people, ISIS, uh, Joe Biden, no matter, all people have this common grace. And, but it's for ultimately the coming, which Christ has already come, but it's the fulfilling now of the work of Christ who is still saving people. Amen. So uh, that's what we would have looked at with the Noahic covenant to how it affects this kingdom of creation because that's still going on. When Jesus was being judged, he said, I'm, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, what is the kingdom of this world? It's this kingdom of creation that's cursed, but stable in a sense because of God's Noahic covenant. And we need to talk about Satan and how he rules over it, but let's, let's uh, pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for these truths. Help us, Lord, to uh, all of us, myself, um, any of the other teachers that are going to speak on these matters, like I know the next one is uh, people of God. I pray, Lord, help us in our study time, help us in our thoughts, help us with our handling of your word uh, to be uh, correct, to be accurate, uh, prayerful, dependent on you, humble and teachable. And teach us, Lord, help us to know uh, more of your kingdom through this study. Amen.